some basic principles one needs to consider when one thinks about the whole issue of clarifying the contribution that people make is first of all to understand that if this is oneself then clearly you're completely surrounded by everything that isn't you you're completely surrounded by the other and in any situation you can either construct your intent on what you're getting or you can construct your intent on what you're giving now the question arises where would you place the issue of cause or of, and effect with get or with give and clearly cause is what you give and the effect is what you get and a good metaphor of this is to think about the relationship between an archer and the bow the archer what sits in the archer's hands the the cause is the the drawing of the bow the taking of aim and the letting fly of the arrow what sits uh, outside of the archer's hand is the flight of the arrow. I mean, that arrow could hit anywhere because of the influence of wind or whatever. So the effect is what he gets. The cause, what he does, is the drawing of the bow. The, the next question then arises, how does this relate to the issue of outcome and process? We're well, going back to our archer example. The outcome is what you get and the process is the actual giving of the drawing of the bow. And finally, so how does it relate to the issue of contribution and result? Then clearly, result is what you get and contribution is what sits in your own hands. It's what you personally give. So what this therefore means is that fundamentally, the effect is actually not in one's personal control because there are all sorts of variables that are concerned with what, the world ha what happens in the world that kind of affect the result. What does, does sit in your hands, what is in your control, is what you're giving. And therefore, how one should view results is that fundamentally results are about getting. Contribution is about what you're giving. And when you assess results, you assess results against the target by using numbers. Have you achieved this? Have you, what was the result that was required of you? Whereas when you assess contribution, you assess contribution against the standard. And what I mean by this is, let's say, for instance, um, um, you, you're coaching somebody to run hurdles and you can see that while they're running, they're not lifting their leg high enough. And uh, at the end of their run, you, you say to them, you know, you're not lifting your leg high enough or your legs high enough. The question is, is your assessment of the person's performance subjective or objective? And clearly, it's perfectly objective. You know, it's not based on some sort of feeling you have. You could see the person's leg wasn't high enough. The, you know, the question is, has this uh, uh, achieved uh, a, a number? No, it hasn't. Um, uh, so you, there's two ways of being objective. In other words, the first way is about producing numbers. And the second way is yes, no against a standard. When you check in contribution, you check in contribution, yes, no against a standard. Now, what that means for somebody who does a job of work. So let's assume we're dealing with a person in a sales environment, a telephonic sales environment then clearly the person does certain tasks on an ongoing basis. He calls clients, he follows a call plan, he does things to close a sale, and that is his contribution. By him doing that, he would produce a result. Uh, the result would be the money that he produces at the end of a sales cycle, whether one's measuring him in a day or a week or a month. Now, that's reasonably straightforward, because what we're therefore saying in terms of our previous logic, if you're assessing this person's contribution, that's what you've got to assess. You've got to assess what they actually do against the standard. Are they doing the tasks required of them well or not well? This issue becomes a little bit more tricky if you're trying to understand what the leader's contribution is. Fundamentally, when I ask leaders this question, you know, what's the leader's job? They're going to say something like leadership is about achieving a result through people. Now, that's a very interesting statement because surely one of the ways of understanding the leader's uh, contribution, the leader's job is to get a team to be committed to work because they really want to. And if you consider what the implication of that statement would be for the, the degree to which somebody is going to work because they have to, because they want to, then um, consider the following, following thought experiment. Let's say you've got two people working for you. The one is called Fred and the other one is called Joe. And you tell Fred, Fred in 1980, I did what you have to do, go and do what I did. You say to Joe, Joe in 1980, I did what you have to do. It may be helpful to you. Take a look at it. Then clearly Fred's going to work because he has to and Joe's going to work because he wants to. And the reason for the difference isn't just because in the Joe interaction, you're in a sense giving Joe a choice. There's more going on than just if, the, if you like, whether you're being sort of more accommodating and democratic with Joe. 
there's a deeper distinction which becomes apparent when you separate these two variables in your mind, means and ends, and you put into those two categories either the person is doing the job or the job that's being done. So if you say to Fred, in 1980, I did what you have to do, go and do what I, d I did, what you're trying to get done is a job, and you're using Fred, the person, as your means or your resource to get the job done. In the Joe case, you're doing the opposite. If you were sincere with Joe, if you meant what you said in 1980, I did what you have to do, and it worked, it might be helpful to you, you could have a completely different outcome from what you had in 1980. It might actually even be a disaster. So what you're trying to do in this instance is you're trying to teach the person, Joe, something, and you're using the job that he's doing as the means to teach him something. That inversion of means and ends says that there's a fundamental change of your intent as the boss. Um, in, your, in the Fred case, your intent is basically to take. Your intent is to get something from Fred. In Joe's case, your intent is to give something to Joe. And unfortunately, if you define leadership through this lens, if you say leadership is about achieving a result through people, we're actually talking the Fred into action. In order to get that, that content to fit the Joe into action, you would have to say something like, leadership is about achieving people through results. Now, that's not as insane as it sounds, because that's exactly what a coach does. Um, a coach doesn't uh, achieve a result. That's what players do. A coach's job is to coach the player. The coach doesn't use the player to get a job done and to achieve a result. He uses the result and the game that's being played as his means to enable the player. The coach's product is the player. In other words, the first thing we need to understand if we're trying to understand a leader's contribution is what the leader actually should be giving to the subordinate rather than the result that the leader is getting from the subordinate. So if we say what we're really trying to understand is the conditions under which the coach is going to enable or the leader is going to enable somebody who works for, for them because they really want to, then, um, uh, you know, we've asked people this question many thousands of times over the years, and you get a, a, an answer to that question, which is pretty consistent with what we have on this list. You know, boss is interested in me, supportive, a mentor, and so on. And what's interesting about that content is that there's two themes in the content. There's a soft theme that has to do with kind of, uh, you know, the, the sort of care. The person has a genuine interest in me. And then there's a harder theme, which, you know, is, is about growth. I mean, if somebody works, if you work for somebody who's always honest with you, they're not always going to be nice. In other words, the leader's role, what the leader should be contributing to subordinate is the care and growth of the subordinate. And that's absolutely universal. You can ask anybody this question, they'll say exactly the same thing, which means to say, if you have somebody who's in charge of you, their job for you is to care for you and grow you. And that's not surprising because our first relationship of hierarchy or power is with our parents. And that's exactly what our parents do. Our parents' job is to care for us and grow us. That is, in fact, what makes the leader's role, the hierarchical role, acceptable. That's what gives the leader the right to be in charge, the right to be the leader. And the, uh, the principle that we can glean out of this is that any relationship of power is legitimate if the aim of that relationship is the caring growth of the subordinate. If we go specifically into what this growth element means, we have the rule of thumb that says, you know, don't give a person a fish, empower them to fish. So if you wanted to empower somebody to fish, you'd first of all give them some stuff. You'd give them a hook, a line, and a sinker, and some bait. And then you'd make the person, you'd teach the person how to use that stuff. And the distinct, distinction between those two categories is that the hook, the line, and the sink and the bait is really about the means to do what's required of them. And uh, the second category is really about the person's knowledge and competence. I feel like it's about their ability. Um, th these two categories of means and ability aren't adequate because if you do all of the stuff and then you say to the person, don't worry, if you don't catch a fish, I'll give you one from my freezer, they still won't, they still won't fish. So the last thing we're going to bring to the party is kind of a, a toughness of mind that says, if you don't catch a fish after this, starve. You've got to hold the person accountable. Now, what that means in an organizational context is that consistent with that idea of means is to give the people working for you the resources, the tools, the authority, the information, a clear standard, the your time. Ability means to teach people how to do what's required of them and why they should be done. And accountability really is about consistent rewards and punishments against a standard. So if somebody can either go the extra mile or they can be careful or they can be deliberately malevolent or they careless, and when they've gone the extra mile, you reward them. If they're careful, you recognize them. If they're malevolent, you punish them. And if they're careless, you censure them. So what all of this means in terms of people's contribution, if you consider the worker in an organization, 
The worker produces a result, but the result is what he gets. His personal contribution is to do a set of tasks to standard, which over a period of time will enable the result to happen. If you consider what the worker supervisor, the overseer does, then clearly the overseer also produces a result, which is also what he gets, which is normally a cumulative result of all of the uh, workers in his area. But the, his personal contribution, the overseer's own contribution, is to do certain tasks himself. Um, any person in a, in a line job has a, uh, does certain tasks themselves that have got nothing to do with the subordinate. They might be um, you know, doing a, a long-term uh, capital plan for their boss or whatever. I mean, but there's certain things that they do that really don't affect their immediate subordinate. But the rest of their role, the rest of what they do is really delivered to them for, for them by a worker. And their contribution with regard to that is to care for the worker and to give the worker the means, the ability and the accountability to do what's required of them. The, so doing the tasks that's required of them means of care, means an ability and accountability given to a subordinate, that really is the overseer's contribution. If we now take this a level up and have a look at the boss's contribution, the boss produces a result. Uh, the, what the boss personally does, what sits in the boss's hands, is to uh, do certain tasks herself and to care for and grow care, give means, ability and accountability to her immediate subordinate. In other words, those five things, that, that's her contribution. And when you're assessing a contribution, that's what you need to assess. When you're defining your contribution, that's what you need to define. So, contribution is concerned with what you personally give.